Hello, and welcome to the Foundation to Quantitative Reasoning course in the Quest program at the University of Vermont. I'm your professor, Dr. Easton White. Today we'll be talking about population ecology generally, giving you a sense of how to understand how to use models in population ecology. This is part of a flipped classroom, so today's homework will be watching this video and taking notes and understanding uh, things that we're talking about. And then a class will come together and actually be working on real life case studies to try to understand the principles that we talked about in this video. So learning objectives for this video are to understand how models can be used in ecology, and we'll talk more about the philosophy of modeling in the, court, in the class itself. Um, understand how to solve simple population models and how to apply qu qualitative tools um, in cases where we can't solve those um, models, for instance. Um, and understand the consequences of density dependence when we start including that in our models and how does that change our modeling choices. So to give you an example, we're going to look at the whooping crane population in North America. And so this population uh, was, saw dramatic declines in the early in the 20th century. And in the 1940s, there's around only 15 or 20 individuals. And at that point, a captive breeding program was started, and it was really successful. And they've grown uh, tremendously since then, and they're now over about 250 individuals in the population as of as 2008. And so what we see here is we see a population that is growing exponentially. This is the type of growth that we see uh, fits this, this population well. We want to understand how to model such a population so that if we were looking at, at exponential growth, we could project forward into the future to try to understand what might happen with the population. So how do we determine the status of a population that we might be concerned about? And so what we want to do here is we want to think about um, what is a population, first off. And so a population, for our purposes, is just a group of organisms from the same species that are living together and have the potential to interbreed with each other. And so the first thing we can do to try to understand a population is write down what we call the conservation equation. And so this is a very simple equation to try to um, get us oriented to what's going on here. We want to think about how do we predict what's going to happen in the next time step. And so what I'd have here is something like n t plus 1 is going to be equal to, so the population n, so n here is the population size, t plus 1, so time next year, or next time step, is going to be equal to the population size now, plus b for births, minus deaths, plus immigration, minus immigration. So this is really the starting point that we're going to be using for any process that we're thinking about um, in modeling a simple population. Uh, and so in this case, we're just saying, well, how do we get to the next year from what we, the information that we have about the population now, and birth, death, immigration, immigration, and other processes? So that's kind of always our starting point when we're thinking about how to model something. So to give you an example, we're going to think about the annual plant species. Um, so this is a California poppy, so it's actually a state flower of California. And again, it's an annual species, so it lives for one year, has seedlings, and then dies. And we want to think about, can we understand the dynamics of this particular flower? Um, thinking about what we had just talked about with exponential growth. And so to do this, uh, we're going to set up um, a um, population growth model. And before we actually set up the model itself, one really useful tool is to try to set out some type of diagram that will allow us to think about how this population is operating. So what this often looks like, it's gonna be something like, let's just draw a circle here. So we'll have N for population size. And then we're gonna have some process um, where you get more N. So you guess it could be births or seedlings or something. In this case, we're gonna have death as well. So I always start with a diagram like this because it helps me figure out what the key processes are involved in this population. So this is a kind of a boring example of this type of diagram, which we often call a flow, uh, flow diagram or box and arrow diagram. But in this case, it's useful to write out um, and we'll think about how then we transfer this to a mathematical model. And so what we're going to do is look very similar to our conservation equation that we just showed. It's going to be NT plus 1, so population next year to be equal to, and because it's an annual plant, we assume all the plants die each year, and they just have some number of seeds 
that make it to the next year. And so the number of seeds that survive, I'm going to say is R. I'm going to multiply that by the previous population size. So what that says is that um, the population next year is equal to the population this year times some number R that represents the number of seeds. So for example, if R is equal to two, that would say that each individual in the population has two um, seedlings that survive to be adults uh, that are flowering the next year, for example. So that's great. That's a very simple setup of this population model. What we want to do is we want to figure out, can we project this model forward to try to understand something about the population? And in order to do that, we need to get this model in terms of N0. So N0 being the initial population size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down, um, for different time steps, I'm going to write down what this looks like. So if I'm saying um, if N0, actually let's just say, let's go with M1. Yeah, sorry, N0, so the first time step, that will make this equation say N of 1 is equal to R M0. So that gives us the equation for the first time step, and then I can do the same thing for the second time step. So t equals 1 is going to be n2 is equal to r times n1. And because we already know what n1 is, we can actually just plug that into this equation. So it's going to be r times r times n0. And again, I can go to the next one iteration of this. Let's say t equals 2. And that's going to be n3 now equals r times n2. And again, I can just kind of iterate this through and go, it's going to be equal to r times r times r times n0. And you can see this pattern starting to form here. And so what I can do is for any time step, I can figure out exactly what this equation would look like. And so that's going to be, let's say, all the way down to something like nt, it's going to be equal to r raised to the t power times n0. And that then is going to be our solved equation. That's going to be the solution to this equation that we call a difference equation. So this, uh, this equation up here is what we call a difference equation. Um, and it's called a difference equation because um, there's it's discrete time. So you have time t, the time t plus 1 is discrete units. Later, we'll look at differential equations as well. But this is a difference equation. So difference. Equation. And this is the solution to the, the difference equation that we have above. And so what we can do now is if we know what r is and we know what n0 is, we can project the population size at any point in the future. And if we try to graph this out, we can see what this would look like. And so let's draw a little graph here. Let me change my color. OK. So I have the, have the graph here. It's going to be time, t, and n. And what we can see is uh, we can see if r is equal to, let's say, 1, then the population is going to stay the same each, each year. So you project that out. Let's just say n0 starts here. This would be the case where r is equal to 1. And we see that if r is greater than 1, we have exponential growth. Population increases, so this is r greater than 1. And the pop, if the r is less than 1, we can see that if we project this forward, exponential decay, so r is less than 1. So that gives us the solution for this very simple example. Um, and it tells us something about the behavior of if we project forward um, with different values of r, what ends up happening. So that's great, and that's super useful. But we also want to see what happens if we don't know, for example, if, we're not, if it's complicated enough that we can't actually solve the equation, we can't actually graph it out over time, we can do some things regarding qualitative behavior. We can try to get the qualitative behavior of the model. So let's see what that looks like. 
And so we're going to be looking at the qualitative behavior of this model. And so that's getting at this idea of finding equilibriums, uh, equilibrium points to the model, and finding the stability of those equilibrium points. Let's write out our model once again. It's the model here that we're working with is n t plus 1 equals r times n t. So that's our original difference equation. And what I'm going to do is going to find equilibrium points. So an equilibrium point is a case where, um, let me just write it here, definition here, an equilibrium point, equilibrium point is value of n, the population size, that will remain constant. constant so over time. So, so it's some value of n that if you reach that value of n, you're going to stay there forever. And so what we do to find this type of uh, equilibrium point in a difference equation is we say, well, let's just assume nt and nt plus 1 are the same. And that will be the equilibrium point. And so what I'll do is I'm going to say n t plus 1, I'm just going to say is n bar. And, and bar here, this is the equilibrium point. So this is the equilibrium, equilibrium point, equilibrium value. Equilibrium point. So I'm going to say n bar is now equal to r times n bar. So I'm just saying that the population is the same at all time. And then what I can see here is that this, is, this equation is only satisfied if n bar is equal to zero, assuming that r is not um, equal to zero. And so that's telling us that the only equilibrium point that we have here is when n bar is equal to zero. So this is our equilibrium value that we have here. So that's saying if the population ever reaches zero, so if the population ever goes extinct, it can't come back from extinction. And that makes sense in the context of what we were looking at, where there's no immigration or emigration, that the population that goes to zero, it's going to stay at zero. So that's great. And that can tell us something about, um, something about the behavior of the population. Uh, it, this particular example, we only have one equilibrium point, but we'll see in future examples where we have multiple equilibrium points. And the population might move from one to another. And so what we want to figure out is, is this equilibrium point stable or unstable? What do we mean by that exactly? And so um, what I'll do here is I'll illustrate the example of stability uh, with um, what we call a cup of, cups and balls diagram. So stability. I'll give you just a definition here. So stability here, we're thinking about local stability. And so a population, um, an equilibrium point is stable, and equilibrium is stable if a small perturbation a small perturbation to um, like basically a small perturbation away from the equilibrium point um, sends that population um, back to the equilibrium point. If a small population, or if a small perturbation um, returns population back to equilibrium. And so when I talk about the cups and balls diagram, what I want to show here, you can imagine a situation where we maybe have some surface. And in the surface, we're going to have these little balls that are sitting in these cups. Like they're there on top of this hill as well. And what you'd see is we're going to say this is an equilibrium point. So is this. Because it's saying that if this ball is sitting in the bottom of this valley, 
it's always going to stay in that bottom of the valley here. It's not going to move at all. And if this ball is perfectly positioned on top of this hill, it wouldn't move one way or the other. Where if it was in between there, it would move uh, down into the valley. And what we see here is that for this particular ball, if it gets pushed in either direction, if you just push it just a little bit, it'll come back to where it was at. So this would be a stable equilibrium. So stable equilibrium. You see this one, um, on top of the sail, if this ball is pushed in either direction, even if it's just nudge just a little bit, um, that ball will move to a different area. And so that's what we call an arm stable equilibrium. So we don't ever say, you know, the population is stable or not stable. We say that the equilibrium that the population might face is stable or unstable in this, in this context. So that's the basic idea of an equilibrium point and figuring out if stability, uh, if, the, if each equilibrium point is stable. And you would do this for each equilibrium point. Here we just have one. So how do we formally figure out if this equilibrium point is actually stable or not? Um, and so this is where we're going to go back to our calculus. And so uh, I'm going to write down um, the growth model here. Um, that governs one year to the next. Uh, I'm going to call as F. Nope, let me change color. So F is the growth of the population, which is going to be equal to R times N. So just saying, in order to get from one year to the next, you would do R times N that we saw on this, in the original equation. I'm just going to call this F for now. Um, and what we want to think about is we want to think about the, the growth or decay of a per perturbation. So we're going to think about if we perturb this population a little bit, um, does it grow? That perturbation grow or does that decrease? Um, another way to think about that is to say, well, what is the curvature of this population? So for this particular ball, if the curvature is positive, that means the, the ball, when it gets perturbed, will tend to get pushed back to where it was at. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the um, derivative of this equation. And so I'm going to have df dn with respect to n. I'm going to take the derivative of that on the other side. That's going to be equal to, in this case, r. And so what that says is that if I perturb the, the, the population, um, if I perturb that ball a little bit, so I change that value of n just a little bit, um, the growth, of, growth or decay of that perturbation We'll change it the rate r in this case. Um, and then we have, um, we'll um, evaluate this. We, we would evaluate this for a particular equilibrium point. And so what that's going to look like is df dn evaluated at n bar. So the equilibrium point equals 0. And this isn't too interesting because in this case, this is just going to be equal to r again. But then we have some um, have a definition for what we mean by stable in a very mathematical context. And so what this says is that if df dn, so the growth rate of a perturbation um, or the curvature around the equilibrium, um, or n bar, or sorry, n, where n is equal to n bar, so we're looking at the equilibrium point itself. So this is going to be the absolute value of this whole thing, the absolute value. If that is greater than 1, then it's unstable. So that's saying that if this value is greater than 1, it's going to be unstable. And that way that ball is going to go away from there. If it was less than one, it would be stable in that case. So if we then look at our example uh, for the particular for n zero, for n bar is equal to zero, uh, we know that that is going to be stable. So the n zero equilibrium, n bar that is equal to zero equilibrium, uh, is stable if 
r is less than one. So that's not very clear. It is less than one. And that's that's the, the key answer that we want to get at there. Is we want to figure out is something stable or not stable. So not even knowing the value for r, for example, we don't we haven't even plugged that in yet. We know that if we get an r that is less than one, we can tell you that the, the population, um, if it is extinct, it's going to stay extinct, even if it's perturbed a little bit above. So if you add one individual to the population, it's still going to remain, remain extinct in this case. Now, if r is greater than one, that means the population, if you're at zero and you added one individual, the population is going to move away from that extinction threshold and move either to a different equilibrium, or in this case, it's going to grow exponentially. But that's what we mean by finding equilibrium points and finding stability. This gives us a lot of information without us even trying to solve a model that could be particularly complicated. And so the idea of exponential growth generally came about um, early on by Thomas Malthus, if not earlier. Well, he was really interested in studying human population size. And so he had noticed um, up to his point in the 1800s, that the population of humans had been growing exponentially. And he was really concerned about this in the context of thinking about natural resources, um, like food, um, water, those types of things, and the, this, growing exp this growing human population size, if that was going to be a concern or not. So he was really the first one to kind of formalize what we meant by exponential growth and thinking about what that looks like for a population. So do we see exponential growth in nature? So we see it all in humans. We saw it for that previous example um, that I started with the whooping crane. And so again, we can see exponential growth in nature, but only in a limited set of cases. So often, after a population starts really small, so this could be something like an endangered species that starts really small, might be able to grow exponentially after that. But it could also be something like an invasive species, where the invader comes into an area and is really low and abundant, it can increase exponentially after that. Um, similarly, we also do see um, exponential decay for populations that are declining. So if population is declining really rapidly, we can get exponential decay. So this is an example of a manta ray off of Costa Rica, um, where the population since the mid-90s has seen an exponential decrease in the number of individuals um, observed there in each, each given year. So we do see exponential growth in nature, uh, whether exponential growth in a positive or exponential decay, um, but we often don't see it for very long. So often the population is growing exponentially, eventually it might start being limited in some way. And this is the idea of density dependence, which may ultimately lead to something like logistic growth. That's what we'll talk about in the next class when we talk about equilibrium stability and more complicated and more interesting examples.